What's going on, everybody? Welcome to We The People podcast. My name is Brett Maurer, and I am the host. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Uh, for anybody that knows that rhyme, you'll know exactly what we are discussing today. Today, we are going to discuss Guy Fox, and we are also going to discuss what made him infamous. Um, and for those who don't know, what made him infamous was the failed gunpowder plot of 1605, an attempted assassination of King James I of England and the English Parliament. So I want to start off by discussing some things that are happening in the background here. Um, obviously, during this time, there is a religious persecution happening in England. Um, the Protestant Church of England is in power and the royal family, along with the church, is basically leading this kind of, the word I'm looking for is not coming to mind, uh, genocide, thank you, brain. Um, it is basically a genocide against uh, Catholicism. They are searching out Catholics and basically trying to exterminate them from England. Uh, so other things that are happening at this time um, is the 80 Years War. The 80 Years War is a war that occurred between Spain and Portugal fighting against England, France, Scotland, um, and the other, you know, united uh, kingdoms. And so that brings us to Guy Fox. Guy Fox was born in 1570 in York, England. Um, when he was older, he went to fight in what is now known as the 80 Years War. Um, Guy Fox had been raised in the Church of England. Um, his parents were both prominent members of the Church of England, as were his grandparents. Um, his mother's family uh, was, at a time, Catholic. Um, and when he went into the war, he began meeting more people who were Catholic. And I am not myself entirely sure how the process went but at some point Guy Fox denounces the Church of England and converts to Catholicism so he converts to Catholicism and eventually he comes home now a little bit of a backstory on what is wrong with Catholicism in this sense. So Henry VIII, former king of England, wanted a marriage annulment from Catherine of Aragon. But the Catholic Church would not provide it. So, what does Henry VIII do? He separates the Church of England from Rome. He separates the Church of England from the Pope, basically. He separates it from Catholicism. And this is when Protestant worship begins to take stronger footing. Now, for those who don't know, Henry VIII goes on to marry Anne Boleyn, and she is the mother of Queen Elizabeth I. We know during... Elizabeth I's reign, and many other monarchs, including um, Edward VI, and even moving into James I, uh, there was stronger religious persecution uh, in England. The Protestants really, truly began um, hunting the Catholics at this time. And Basically, there was a call for James I to express more religious tolerance 
for Catholics. He wanted they wanted the king to speak out and say that there should be religious tolerance for Catholics. This obviously did not happen. Okay? And when this did not happen, Catholics um began to speak out. In 1603, um, he, uh, I'm sorry, in 1603, Guy Fawkes, rather than he, uh, Guy Fawkes traveled to Spain in order to basically seek support for a Catholic revolution in England. Um, the throne of Spain was Catholic at this time. And so if he was able to gain support, then this rebellion would have a much better chance. He described James I, and James I would become king in 1603. Um, so this is just before uh, James I takes the throne. He describes James I as a heretic. And he is quoted with having said that he will, quote, have all of the papists driven out of England. And obviously papist was a term used to describe Catholics. Guy Fawkes also denounced Scotland um, and all of those nobles who were among the king's favorite. Um, and he basically is credited with having said, quote, it will not be possible to reconcile these two nations as they are for very long. He was received. Um, by Philip III, who was, once again, the king of Spain at the time. Um, but Spain was unwilling to offer him support. So James I takes the throne. James I uh, basically says he will not support uh, more religious tolerance. Um, and this is an important thing um, because there is a lot that kind of snowballs off of this. Um, this is a Catholic rebellion in the making against England, and this will not be the first. We see many, many rebellions um, that are kind of Influenced, uh, not influenced, but um, what's the word I'm looking for? They are powered. Rather than saying influenced, I want to say powered. They are directly powered by religion. Okay? And directly powered by Catholicism. By the wanting of a Catholic on the throne. So, in 1604, Guy Fawkes becomes involved with a group of English Catholics. This group is read, excuse me, is led by Robert Catsby. Robert Catsby, obviously, uh, became the head of this conspiracy known as the Gunpowder Plot. This group planned to assassinate the Protestant king, James I, and they wanted to replace him with his daughter. Now, his daughter was Princess Elizabeth. She was third in the line of succession. Princess Elizabeth was the queen of Bohemia because she went on to marry Frederick V. Now, she was also known 
as Elizabeth Stewart. For those who don't know, Elizabeth Stewart holds the name of the Stewart family, and the Stewart family holds a power among Catholics at this time, and even moving into the future. So James I was James I because of there being a union between Scotland and England. He was actually known as James VI because he had been James the Sixth, King of England and Ireland. He was the sixth king named James for England. Now, this is important because what will happen later on in history is the Stuarts will be removed from the throne. The Stuarts eventually are removed from the throne. And basically, um, later on in the mid-1700s, and it happens multiple other times, but the mid-1700s is the biggest one. In 1745, there will be another revolution. This will be a failed revolution. The Stuart family will try to reclaim the throne of Scotland. And they will be supported by what are known in the modern day now as Jacobites. Jacobites were supporters of the Stuart cause in the mid-1700s to retake the throne. This was a group of this was a large army, rather, rather than a group. It was a large army made up of Scottish Catholics who wanted to see a Catholic ruler put back on the throne. This army was made up mostly of Scottish Highlanders, and it would end at the Battle of Culloden in 1745. For those who don't know, Culloden was a disaster. Um, and basically, the Scottish Highlanders were exterminated. And that's not necessarily the best way to say that because they weren't exterminated in a sense that they are now extinct. But those who fought at that battle were massacred. Those who survived the battle were executed. And it also brought about the attempted destruction of the Highlander way of life. And the reason I say attempted is because things have changed um, since 1745. Obviously, laws change. Um, things like that, discriminations change. Um, but what had happened was, after this, um, no one in the Kingdom of Scotland was able any longer to possess firearms. No one was able to wear their clan tartans. Um, and there were, you know, there were so many things that the English put into place. And it basically changed their way of life. It took their way of life away from them. And they never lost that way of life. They clung to it. They held on to it. And eventually those rules were changed. Those laws were changed. And it's great that they were changed. But it's nonetheless a difficult thing to have your entire culture taken from you in an instant. And that is exactly what happened. And so that is why this is important. It's important because this is now what I would consider 
um, the first rising of supporters for a Stuart cause. Not that Princess Elizabeth had anything specifically to do with this rising, but there are people rising up in revolution to put her on the throne specifically because she is a Stuart member of government who is in support of Catholicism. So, getting back to our topic, these gentlemen begin to plot, and they decide they are going to fill underneath the Parliament building with gunpowder and blow the building up. Now, this was an issue to some of the people in the group um, as the day approached because they were worried about members of Parliament who were also Catholic. And basically what happened is a few conspirators who, like I said, were concerned about uh, their fellow Catholics who were in Parliament authored a letter. And in this letter, they warned, specifically this letter was written to Lord Montagle, who was a member of the House of Lords. And he received this anonymous letter, basically warning him to stay away from Parliament. Do not go to Parliament. Don't do it. Something terrible is going to happen. Like, do not go into this meeting. And despite having become aware of the letter, the conspirators resolved to continue with their plans. Um, because the conspirators knew that Lord Monteagle had to have known. And it was now up to him whether he take it or not. And the conspirators resolved to continue with their plans after basically the letter was thought to be a hoax. On the 30th of October, Guy Fox kind of surveys uh, the Undercroft. And at the same time, Lord Montagle kind of gets suspicious. His suspicions become aroused. And he shows the letter to King James. King James then orders that a search be conducted. And there was a search conducted of all the cellars underneath the Parliament building. A search was taken in the early hours of the 5th of November. Now, Guy Fox did not take up his station until late on the 4th. That being said, with him showing up late, he then had to stay longer. Now, a famous part of this story is that Guy Fox was given a watch by one of the other conspirators so that he would not let time get away from him. But yet he shows up late, which requires him, obviously, then to stay longer in order to get the job done. He, is ended, he ends up being discovered as he's leaving this cellar. And shortly after midnight, he is arrested. Inside, guards find barrels of gunpowder, and these barrels of gunpowder had been stockpiled and hidden um, under piles of firewood and coal. 
So then moving forward, Fox is arrested and questioned. He lies, says that he has no clue what they're talking about. There was no plot. He gives them a false name. He gives them the name of John Johnson, which was a pseudonym he had been living under um, for some time now. So then, finally, he does give an answer to what his intention was with having that much possession of gunpowder and storing it under Parliament. And he, he says, quote, to blow you Scotch beggars back to your native mountains. Um, and his questioners note that he has wounds on his body. And he tells them, he tells his questioners that this was the effects of pleurisy. Pleurisy, for those who don't know, is an illness of the lungs. It's when the tissues around the lungs and the heart become inflamed and can even sometimes get um, liquid in them. So, eventually, Fox admits to his intentions to blow up the House of Lords. And he expresses that he regrets his failure to finish the job. And throughout this whole time, he withholds this kind of strong, steadfast manner. And he, you know, composes himself with a grin and shows no remorse. And King James um, kind of admires this. Um, King James described him as having, quote, a Roman resolution. Very strong and stoic and proud. But the king's admiration uh, did not prevent him from ordering that on the 6th of November, they torture Guy Fox. The king wanted to know what the names of his co-conspirators were, what the actual plan was, where they were planning this, everything. He wanted everything. The king gave orders that the torture be simple and easy and not terrible to begin with, and that if seen as necessary, the severity increase. And he even gave permission for the use of the rack. And for those who don't know what the rack is, is it resembles a ladder. It's not a ladder, but that's what it, it kind of resembles one. It's basically this arched, or rather than, it's a um, sloped board, or a sloped, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It resembles almost a garden trellis. That's what it looks like. It looks like a ladder. It's basically a slatted platform. There we go. That's the wording I'm looking for. It's a slatted platform that is uh, laid at a slope. And on either end, there is um, what would be, you know, like shackles or ties, something of that nature. And they would tie your arms above your head and they would attach your legs at the bottom. And basically they would turn this wheel that pulled your limbs farther and farther apart until eventually your joints gave out. And they that is exactly what they would do. They would basically pull your joints apart. Um, and so... The king composes a list of questions, and he wants answers for these questions. Um, and one of these things that is brought up is the king wants to know, quote, as to what he is, for I can never yet hear of any man that knows him. Where, when, 
excuse me, when and where he learned to speak French, if he was a papist, and who brought him up in it. Eventually, this room where Guy Fox is interrogated would become known as the Guy Fox room. So this is a room in the Tower of London where he was held and tortured and questioned. Now, Sir William Wad, who was a lieutenant at the Tower of London, supervised Fox torture and was the one who obtained his confession. He searched Fox and did find a letter addressed to him. And to Wad's surprise, Fox remained silent, revealing nothing about the plot or about the letter's authors or anything like that. On the night of the 6th of November, Fox spoke with uh, the lieutenant and um, the lieutenant had written this confession down, basically, and it was something along this lines of what he wrote down. It's, quote, he, this is in reference to Guy Fox, told us that since he undertook this action, he did every day pray to God he might perform that which might be for the advancement of the Catholic faith and saving his own soul. According to the lieutenant, Fox managed to rest throughout the night, despite his being warned that he would be interrogated until, quote, I had gotten the inward secrets of his thoughts. That being said, um, considering he decided to rest the rest of the night, um, Guy Fox's composure was to be broken um, the following day. Um, Fox revealed his true identity on the 7th. This was obviously after torture. He told his interrogators that there were five people involved in the plot to kill the king. On November 8th, he began to release their names. And he explained to them that they intended to place Princess Elizabeth on the throne. On the ninth, he gave his third confession. His third confession on the ninth implicated Francis Tresham. Francis Tresham was a member of of the gunpowder plot. And he was also a member of the failed rebellion involving the Earl of Essex that occurred um, against the government in 1601. And he was imprisoned for this. Um, and so this is now a reoccurring offense, uh, basically. Um, <clears throat> it is to this day uncertain if they ever actually used the rack on Guy Fox, But Guy Fox's signature... Um, that we have now where he um, signed his name after his torture indicates to us that he did endure some form of suffering at the hands of his interrogators. So then a trial began. Uh, once the... Basically, they started rounding people up, and a trial of eight of the plotters began in 1606 on the 27th of January. Fox uh, shared the barge from the Tower of Westminster Hall 
with seven of his co-conspirators. They were all kept in the Star Chamber before they were taken into Westminster Hall, where they were displayed on a scaffold. Um, the king and his family, who were watching in secret, were among the spectators as the Lord's commissioners read out the list of charges. This was when the name of Guido Fox, which Guido was the Italian um, name that Guy Fox went by for some time. Um, and Guy Fox pleaded not guilty. Despite his apparent acceptance of the guilt, um, since he had been captured, his guilt that he had not succeeded, um, and then giving all of the information and things. The jury ended up finding that all defendants were guilty. And they were pronounced guilty of high treason. And the attorney general condemned them to be drawn backwards to their deaths by horse. So basically um, what this meant was they would be tied to a horse and they would slap that horse's rear end or something of that nature and drag him through the streets until they died. Um, they, the idea here was, um, they were to be put to death halfway between heaven and earth as unworthy of both. Their genitals were to be cut off and burnt before their eyes and their bowels and their hearts were to be removed. They would then be decapitated and dismembered and the dismembered parts of their bodies were to be displayed um, at the four corners of the nation. So for those who know the story of William Wallace, this is a similar situation. Um, William Wallace was drawn and quartered. Now, there are a couple different meanings to the phrase drawn and quartered. Um, this could be in reference to having your forelimbs tied to horses and pulled apart, which was a famous Mongolian um, form of execution during the time of Genghis Khan. But another form of drawing and quartering um, was that you would be hung and you would be hung basically until you were close to death. Then you would be cut down and you would be laid out on a table in front of the crowd and basically um, field dressed for, for a little bit better PG term. Um, you would be field dressed. And yeah, you would have your entrails removed and burned, and then they would put you out of your misery by decapitating you. And then after William Wallace suffered this, they took different parts of his body and displayed them on different prominent buildings in the English Empire, um, including the Tower of London. And um, if I'm not mistaken, they displayed something on London Bridge. And so that is what is getting ready to be done to these conspirators. Um, once again, their genitals would be cut off and burned before them, along with their bowels and their hearts. Um, they would be decapitated and dismembered, and then their limbs uh, and head would be displayed so that they might become prey for the fowls of the air. 
Um, Fox and Tresham's testimony regarding the Spanish treason was read aloud, as well as confessions related specifically to the gunpowder plot. The last piece of evidence offered um, was a conversation between Fox and another gentleman who had been kept in an adjacent cell. The two men apparently thought they had been speaking in private, but their conversations were intercepted by a government spy. When the prisoners were allowed to speak, Fox explained his not guilty plea as ignorance of certain aspects of indictment. Um, because there was just basically too much evidence against him. Um, on the 31st of January in 1606, Fox and three others uh, were dragged. This is, you know, this is where the drawn part comes from. They were uh, dragged by horse from the tower to the old palace yard at Westminster. This, um, was a spot that was actually just opposite of the building that they were going to destroy. So the last thing they saw was the house of parliament. <laughs> um, Guy Fox's fellow plotters were hanged and eviscerated and quartered. Fox was the last one to stand on the scaffolding. He asked the king for forgiveness. He asked the state for forgiveness. And while keeping up with his, quote, crosses and idle ceremonies, he had already been weakened by torture and was being aided by the hangman because of how weak he was. But nonetheless, he was forced to climb the ladder to the noose. Um, but either through jumping to his death or climbing too high so the rope was incorrectly set, um, he managed to be one of the lucky ones. Um, unlike his conspirators, he was not drawn and quartered because when he was hung, his neck snapped. For those who don't know, and I have just described to you the drawing and quartering, drawing and quartering was an entertaining art. Those who came to see an execution wanted to see the person struggle. They wanted to see them squirm and hang. They wanted to see them still alive and breathing when their organs were being shifted. They wanted to see them alive and breathing when their organs were being burned. They wanted to see them alive and breathing up until the point when their head was removed. But Fox got lucky. He did not have to withstand the final torture. Um, no one knows whether he climbed too high on the ladder or... Um, if it was because of the way he jumped or what it was, but his neck snapped and it was custom that his body parts were to be distributed to the four corners of the kingdom and it displayed as a warning to the other would be traitors. This is why they were quartered, and this is what they did with William Wallace. They displayed parts of his body on, you know, the Tower of London, on London Bridge, um, at other parts of the nation, and because he had not gone through the full show, um, Guy Fawkes' body was still, nevertheless, quartered. It's very odd, isn't it? Um, you know, you would think that he was dead, so they didn't get to go through the whole process. They were just going to stick him in the ground somewhere, but no, he was still part of this plot. He, um, still was to suffer the end payment, 
So his body was quartered and he was placed on the four corners of the kingdom as a warning. James I then made it a holiday, the 5th of November, as a day to celebrate overcoming calamity. Um, on the 5th of November in 1605, Londoners were encouraged by the king to celebrate his escape from assassination. Uh, they were to light bonfires, um, provided that these were testimonies of joy um, and without any danger or disorder. And as an act of parliament, it was then designated that each 5th of November um, would be a day of thanksgiving for the joyful day of deliverance. And this remained a force until about 1859. Um, Fox was one of 13 conspirators, but he is the individual that is most associated with the plot because he is who had been caught. He is who eventually gave all the information. Um, you know, to this day in the fifth of the, in Britain, the fifth of November, um, which some call Guy Fox day. Um, others, I have heard it called plot night, um, by some of my own friends that I know from the area and some call it bonfire night. Um, I don't, obviously live in Britain, so I'm taking their word for it, but um, it's still to this day now kind of a popular celebration day. Bonfires are lit, fireworks um, are set off, and it became custom after 1673 for some uh, to burn an effigy. Um. Back in the late 1600s, this effigy was typically of the Pope. Um, but obviously, as time goes on and there's new political issues, um, those effigies changed. If that is still done, I cannot comment. Um, but that is what we know from the history. So yeah, that was the story of Guy Fox and the failed gunpowder plot. And, you know, it's kind of actually one of my favorite stories because it's not often that we get to hear about these mass um, conspiracies uh, where, you know, they failed. So I just, I always find it really interesting. Um, so yeah, that's it for today. Um, if anybody has any topics they want to hear about, make sure you comment in, you can message into our Facebook page. Um, I'm going to keep releasing these videos. Go check out the videos in the politics section. There's some more videos here in the history section if you're interested. And, you know, let me know, let me know what you guys want to hear about. Everybody stay safe. Everybody stay healthy. Wherever you're at, enjoy the rest of your week that's coming up, and I will see everybody next time.